G'day guys, welcome back to my channel, my name is Wildcard. Thank you for watching the Wildcard Rugby Show. Like, comment and subscribe. And yes, you are here today because <laughs> the Wallabies will be playing against the Springboks this weekend away in South Africa. Yes, it's going to be the most beautiful city in all of South Africa and that is the Western Cape Town of Perfectain. It is a place where, you know, thanks to all the Australian immigrants that actually has electricity 24 hours a day, 7 days a week, believe it or not, and... You can park your Mercedes outside of Burns Beach, right? And it's not going to have the logo stolen, right? So, yeah, you know, it is just a nightmare for the Aussies to go there. And to come out with a win will surely be just nothing short of a miracle. But hey, but hey, let's check out this beautiful place, Burns, Burns Beach in Perth, right? Look at these beautiful properties that is perfectly suitable for a young, vibrant, and wealthy Africana family, right? Uh, only 1.29 million for this one. 528 square meters. <laughs> so cheap. Uh, so cheap, my cheap bargain. I mean, why hasn't this been sold yet? It's so cheap. Why hasn't this been sold yet? I mean, should be picking them up with cash, right? 375 square meters. 1.4 million. This must be in Rand. This must be in Rand. Okay. I'm sorry. This is in Rand. This is not in Australian dollars. This is in Rand. Okay. The most beautiful city in South Africa. Perfect tank. 1.4 million for 375 square meters. Okay. Anyway, now that. Focus. Stop laughing. Okay. Uh, now that we've established. Uh, you know, the, the, the most beautiful place in South Africa and all the South Africans have unsubscribed from this channel at this point. So yes, it's time to talk about the Springboks and Dr. Rassi Erasmus in his typical fashion when playing at home has decided to put out the world famous number one team in the world, the South African B team. Okay, the Springboks B team will be playing this weekend against the Wallabies. And you know, if you, if you ever wonder, uh, wonder... You know, if you ever wonder how to save the Wallabies, I think this might be... <laughs> 40, 43 points to 12. Oh, God. <clears throat> Sorry. Let's, let's just focus and talk about the team, right? Let's just focus and talk about the team. So, yes, a, a number of new players. Uh, and big changes, especially in the starting four pack. A lot of, you know, returning veterans that hasn't played for a while in the back line. And uh, basically, yeah, the, the core... Powerhouse players are coming off the bench. Uh, it's interestingly only a three, um, sorry, five three setup on the bench. And probably most interestingly is that Rassi Rasmus has locked that Joe Schmidt conundrum, not able to decide who should be the starting five eight for the Wallabies. He has decided for this game play with four, and some people tell me five uh, half fly halves for the Springboks. So they've got Cheslin Kobe and, uh, you know, uh, what's his name? The, the, the Sasha Fangbook and Gomezulu in the starting duo, uh, five eights, and also has Hundred Pollard and Man in the Box on the bench. And apparently, Apalele Farsi can play fly half as well. So, yes, they have to make sure that the fly half position is covered for this game because it's very, very important. And uh, yeah, let's look at who's in, who's out, and who's get, getting the privilege to represent the world-famous Springbok Speed Team to play the Wallabies this weekend in the beautiful, beautiful city that is only 13 and a half hours away from Durban, the beautiful South African city of Perfect Tang, right? So, first up, coming in at, at the uh, loose set proposition, Jan Hendrik Vessels will be getting his second cap for the Springboks this weekend. Johan Huebla will be getting uh, number two jersey. Thomas Tutoy, the big prop, Comes in at number three. I've been waiting to see him for a while. He did really well in the URC. Saman Morat will be coming in at number four, who will also be the captain. Uh, there was a bit of a question asked, why is Morat the captain ahead of Peter Sepp Toy? And Rossi actually gave a pretty interesting answer. He's saying that the, the way the captaincy works is that it's kind of like a support system that you have experienced players supporting the guy that's decision-making. Uh, like Sia Khaleesi has, you know, Bungi and Ibn Esbeth basically consulting him on what to decide. In fact, if you watch the game closely, Sia Khaleesi often asks Ibn, especially, 
what to do when the penalty is given. So yeah, so there's kind of like that, you know, that that that, that system going on here. And Rasi is looking at basically giving Morat some opportunity to develop his personal skills as a captain with the assistance of Peter Sub Toy by his side, essentially. Uh Ruan Nortish, Nortjit, Nort Nortish come. Ruan Nort Nortjit, uh, anyway, comes in number five. Marco van Staden comes in number six. Peter Sub Toy number seven. Al Al Reich. Low coming in number number eight, Morde van der Berg coming number nine, Sasha Fangberg and Gomez Zulu coming number ten, Marco Zulu my PP number eleven returning veteran, number twelve someone we haven't seen for a very long time, Lukam your arm especially in number twelve jersey he's normally plays number thirteen and it's to see it's good to see how he pairs up with Jesse Krill here and obviously Andre Esther Hazen has been suspended and uh, normally I'll, I would I was expecting maybe Esther Hazen and Kana Moody. In the 12th, 13 setup for the uh, for the Springboks B team, maybe even Andre Esterhazen and Lukamio Arm for the 12th, you know, 13 setup. But hey, it's interesting to see that Lukamio has been moved to the 12th jersey. Jesse Krill comes in at number 13, as always. Number 14, Cheslin Kobe, the guy that's going to be probably guiding Sasha a lot this weekend. Last week we saw uh, Cheslin play a bit of a halfback, bit of 5 8, just to take off that load a little bit. This week there will be no Villa LaRue. To do, you know, to, to hold Sasha's hand. So basically, the training wheels are off, and Sasha's gonna be pretty much relying on himself with a little bit of assistance from Cheslin. And then finally, Apalele Farsi uh, will be in the number 15 jersey. So the kicking game will be a little bit less from Farsi. He'll be more of a ball runner and a counter attacker. And I guess it will be up to Sasha a lot of the times to tell Farsi what he wants to do uh, when the ball is being dealt to the back line. And coming in the reserves now, a uh, very, very powerful four-pack coming off the bench. Malcolm Marks, Ox and Che, and Vincent Koch, the Rugby World Cup winning, essentially set up for the Springboks. Uh, the old, you know, the the the, 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 the basically and Che and Vincent Koch are the guy, two guys that basically won the World Cup for the Springboks. So this is going to be extremely brutal. And uh, yeah, this is going to be where the game is won for the Springboks. Edmund Esbeth as well coming in number 19 and number 20. Uh, Albertus Smithberger, again, the most impactful player off the bench, will be coming number 20. Uh, the Springboks, like I mentioned, has opted for one fewer forward on the bench. Grant Williams, sorry, Grant Williams will be coming number 21. <clears throat> and uh, he will be uh, alongside of two fly halves, like I said, Manuel Bok 22 and Andre Pollard will be coming in at number 23. So it'll be interesting to see how this is going to go. I think what's going to happen is they, they're going to be moving... Um, if they're going to be moving Sasha to the fullback position at some point, maybe early in the second half to have Manu the ball come on and then have Hundred Pollard maybe not even play at all and maybe come on as a, you know, uh, as a fullback option to uh, to cover to, to maybe like last 10 minutes or something just to, to, to you know, to give uh, Sasha a bit of a break towards the end. But I, I, yeah, really, I think Hundred Pollard probably won't be involved that much, if at all this game and unless obviously to an injury so yeah that's what i think here and uh yeah let me know your thoughts i think this is going to be especially one in the second half with the spring box yeah we'll see we'll see and you know the wallabies obviously haven't announced the team yet so they could potentially put up a miracle with a really really good team announcement <laughs> but hey we'll see what happens right and obviously the rugby world rankings still has the uh wallabies ranked number one south america uh is you know, facing a bit of a conundrum this weekend. Should they lose to the Wallabies at home in Perth, they're actually going to drop down to second place to Ireland. Yeah, so any any loss, even a draw, will put them below Ireland this weekend. So, yeah, that is going to be a quite an interesting, interesting battle that's going to be happening uh, in Perthington. So, yeah, Rusty already, you know, we'll talk about this. Samuel Mora will be the captain. Uh, there was a bit of an update on Achia Snaymond. He was named in the team last week and he wasn't able to play due to a foot injury. <clears throat> so he's uh he's still he hasn't been replaced completely to the by the squad, but he's just, you know, they're gonna go, go back to South Africa soon anyway. So he's just not gonna be playing. <clears throat> and obviously everybody's looking at talking about why the Wallabies lost. You know, I, I thought we surely would have won this one, we changed the law. We bribed the referee and none of that seemed to work. And, uh, you know, I think ultimately we, we really had to sandpaper the ball. But, you know, I didn't think anybody did that. So that's probably why we lost because we did not sandpaper the ball. 
but according to Matt Williams, right? Apparently it's because we recruited too many Kiwi coaches, right? Because, you know, the the, the, the best way to go is getting Australian coaches like Eddie Jones. That'll, that'll be a much better option, right? Because we know Matt, in fact, we know Matt Williams is a big fan of Eddie Jones. They used to work together. You should go watch some of his interview when he talked about uh, when he's talking about Eddie Jones on the Irish show off the ball, he's just literally like kissing Eddie Jones' ass and to the dismay of the Irish pundits. They're just like, they're just like yeah, uh, we, we, got, we, we kind of invited you to, to, talk, to talk trash about Eddie Jones and you're just sitting here kissing his ass, right? So yeah, Matt Williams is just that kind of, you know, that kind of person, you know, criticizing. In fact, he actually said Joe Schmidt badly lost his way in 2019 when he lost the Rugby World Cup. I mean, had a pretty poor run Rugby World Cup. I mean, nobody has made it out of the quarterfinal yet. So, can't be that bad, right? So, yeah. So, Matt Williams is uh, just just one of the most... One of the most... One of the most... Um, people are screaming outside. So, yeah, so Matt Williams is just one of those... Uh, one of those people that, you know, talks... Yeah. Anyway, moving on. So, yeah, um, for me... You know, like, uh, so Joe Schmidt obviously talked about his thoughts on why the Wallabies lost. Obviously, there's a difference in experience. Um, but also, Joe Schmidt talked about, you know, just the execution wasn't quite there. The the physicality wasn't quite there. Some of the little set piece, obviously, the scrum wasn't working, which I kind of agree. And uh, just he really wants to look at more improvement on, you know, getting that structure back in play and try to build towards uh, a more, you know, more, you know, build towards a more, the, 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 the build towards the, the structure they've been working with previously against Georgia, essentially, um, according to Joe. So there was a bit of a conundrum as well for Joe. Like I said, uh, Rassi Rasmus has solved the problem with four halfback, sorry, four fly halves. And I really thought, yeah, no, a lot of seal. His defense hasn't been great. I really thought maybe there was going to chance to move uh, Liner in the starting position for this for for, for 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 the last game in Brisbane. So maybe we'll see Liner in the starting game this week. But um, yeah, Joe Schmidt, none of his you know his two top fly halves, no a lot of CEO, and Ben Donaldson hasn't really been yeah delivering any sort of uh, any sort of goods so far for the team. So yeah, we'll have to see how that's going to be shuffled up. A few injuries as well for the Wallabies. The biggest one is Filippo Dalgunu. The guy is probably the, one of the best defenders so far this season. And, you know, he's been selected at the winger position for his defense. Um, yeah, he's been injured. So it's a big loss for, for the Wallabies. <coughs> Fractured fibula. Also, Nick Frost is going to be lost in the lineups as well. And Jeremy Williams as well to concussion. So they might be able to return due to their return to play protocol. So, yeah, so that's going to be a bit of a loss. Now, let's move on to New Zealand. Obviously, the big thing on the weekend was the New Zealand lost to, uh, lost to, um, what do you call it? <clears throat> was this playing the background the whole time? Hopefully not. We'll have a look, look later. So yeah, New Zealand lost to, um, Argentina on the weekend. And, you know, Sir John Kerwin has finally learned rugby. So let's, uh, let's listen to what John Kerwin had to say. This is on my Instagram. So. Think about it. We need to take them on up front. There wasn't a scrum, yes. right? So how do you how do you um, really start them crying? When I heard this, you take them on in the scrum and you smash them in the scrum. When I heard this, I almost fell off my chair. So yeah, John Kerwin wants to see more scrum, which he's actually absolutely right because the the All Blacks played you know 50, 60 minutes without a single scrum, despite absolutely slaughtering Argentina in the scrummaging in the 2023 Rugby World Cup. So a really big strategic loss for the All Blacks, not having any scrums uh, for like 60 minutes, whether it's pride, whether it's just a lack of, you know, lack of critical thinking off the field amongst the coaches. It was, yeah, definitely played into the Argentinians' favor, not having any scrums for about 60 minutes. But yeah, in, in addition to that, the All Blacks, I thought, <clears throat> for me, was the fact that they did not capitalize on their opportunity to pressure the Argentinians for tries. They opted for kicking goals way too much and they didn't. They were not adventurous enough to, to seize the moments, seize the momentum that was swinging in their favor, especially early in the second half to try to capitalize that into more points. And I think ultimately it comes down to the players, a lack of preparation, lack of, yeah, lack of confidence maybe between the players <clears throat> to opt for goal kicking when they had the, you know, ascendancy when Argentina was conceding penalties. But um, yeah, I think this little play here was probably the worst I have ever seen out of the All Blacks ever. Okay, this is the worst play I've ever seen out of the All Blacks 
ever. So let's quickly have a look at this one. It's just... Hang on, just let me fix the music a little bit. <clears throat> yeah, so let's just uh, have a look at this for for the All Blacks. So yeah, the ball was, you know, Artie Savea passed the ball over the head of nobody. And Damien McKenzie, again, another pass to nobody. And this was tackled in goal uh, on Riku Yuani. And the Argentinians won the game following this play. They scored a try from the scrum. And um, yeah, this is what I'm talking about. The moments that you capitalize and you pressure. And the, the, the All Blacks just did not have that... Um, yeah, have that fighting fighting power to, to, to push through the difficult times and they wanted to just chip away with three. I think that was the main reason why they lost this one. And there's obviously other, there was a lot of different theories as well. Some people were talking about the, you know, the lack of caps coming off the bench. I don't think that's an issue. <clears throat> the talent was there for the All Blacks, not just the cap issue. <clears throat> there was people talking about in New Zealand pundits where they think that the resting period, the, the All Blacks resting period during Super Rugby was hurting the players, giving them too much break during the during the season. Uh, I somewhat agree to that, but I don't think that's the main reason. I think that, you know, the, 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 that was just probably bad for the viewers when they resting, like, you know, all the All Blacks at the same time. And then, like, you pretty much don't bother watching that weekend because nobody, like, you know, it's, it's like not worth watching at that point. So that's probably more to a financial thing than actually going to worth hurting the All Blacks experience. I think ultimately, yeah, I think probably uh, th th there was another reason here. I'm just going to touch on as well. So <clears throat> there was also another theory that the, 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 the selection process from the All Blacks is because of the fact that they have a lot of, they hired a lot of different coaches, look at different segments of the team, like forwards, you know, tied five, and then you have, you know, the, the back line and every coach is uh, there's different coaches responsible for making the selections for different positions and and they think that there was, a, there was a theory that this selection process has led to like a disconnect between the players which i think it's could potentially be an issue but you know obviously in in the end razor has to sign off on the selection so it's not just like they make the decision and razor is left with whatever they say razor still has a say to it but i think more importantly it's the fact that Razor has hired a lot of the rugby, uh, super rugby coaches that he thoroughly destroyed in super rugby as his assistant coaches, all right? And these coaches are all, you know, all really great coaches by their own right. And, you know, there's nothing wrong with these coaches, but it's just that I don't think they actually add anything to Razor in terms of the way he functions the team. He already, like Razor has already out, has already more knowledge that all of these coaches combined by beating them every year in Super Rugby, right? So having these coaches in, the, in his fold is not actually going to bring anything, anything new to Razor and his coaching. And I think that, you know, if you look at Ian Foster, he's brought in coaches that are more experienced than him. He, you know, with Joe, Sch like, you know, Joe Schmidt as his advisor. And he brought in, you know, at times, Sleep Handsome to help out. So he's brought in people that's better than him and uh, with more knowledge and international experience than him. Whereas Razor, I think he's got that, uh, that, 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 you know, the, the girls team coach, what is his name? Uh, oh God, I forgot. He's, he's, he's got like, uh, what's his name? Wayne, uh, Wayne Smith. I think he's the only one. That's kind of like the experienced guy that's still there from the All Black setup, but he just hasn't got, you know, the, 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 the international, he hasn't really got that, the, the people that are, you know, more experienced than him, enough people that are more experienced than him in the All Black setup to help him with the, 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 the decision-making that is required to win test matches. I think that's probably the big issue, bigger issue than just the fact that, than the fact that the selection process is segmented and assigned to different coaches. So yeah, I think that's probably more, more of an issue. And also there was some talking about the game not being sold out. So 34,500 stadium was sold only, um, what, 20, 20, 24,000 tickets sold. I mean, it is, yeah, it, uh, people were saying that it's because the, the, um, the, you know, the, the New Zealand uh, economic uh, conditions are not that great. Um, but yeah, Argentinian games are always pretty hard to sell out. Um, yeah, it's it's just, just yeah, it is just, just what it is. But um, yeah, moving on, uh, New Zealand has re-signed Josh Lord 
in the fold, uh, he'll be staying at the Chiefs till 2026. So that's a big signing. And again, locks is a position that the All Blacks need to start building towards the future. And um, yeah, for Argentina, you know, the the way that they were, they, were, they handled the game, they really fronted up to the All Blacks. I thought it was, yeah, it was, you know, Felipe, Felipe, Felipe Contepomi did a really good job taking Argentina into another level take after taking over Michael Checa. So yeah, this weekend coming up, it's going to be at Eden Park, where the kind of is going to be able to beat the All Blacks or even come close to beating All Blacks this weekend. It's going to be a really big testament to his, yeah, to his team and his coaching, you know, at Eden Park, forget about winning. If he can stay close, I think we'll come out, um, you know, a really, really big, big, big thumbs up to a nod to his ability as an international test coach. Yeah, even if you look at Kondopomi, just a little quick side note, he was under Michael Checker as the assistant and basically taken, used, you know, Michael Checker, used, you know, learned from Michael Checker with, for about four years before taking over as head coach for Argentina, right? Razor didn't have any of that experience for the All Blacks. Yeah, so let me know your thoughts there. Uh, moving on. So the Rugby World Cup in 2027 has been a little bit of change. So there's going to be more teams adding into the competition. And as a result, there will be 24 team in this tournament. And I think this is going to be like a, like a round of, like, you know, like a wild card rounds before the quarterfinals as well. So this is basically what's going to happen. This is going to be 12 teams that finish top three in each of the pools in the 2023 World Cup, which is basically the six nation nations, plus the rugby championship nations, plus Japan and Fiji uh, already qualified for the rugby World Cup 2027. <clears throat> In addition, there will be three teams from the Pacific Nations Cup, which will be basically uh, Japan and Fiji aside. It'll be, uh, you know, between Tonga, Samoa, um, Tonga, Samoa, uh, America, and uh, Canada. So it'll be, it'll be three teams for them. And then the, 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 the next team down, the sixth team down. So the sixth team, that'll make it five teams. So the sixth team, the last team in the whole tournament, will go to play in a playoff match and from that playoff match i'll be playing against a playoff match from south america and from that playoff match they will go into the qualifying round so yeah so so yeah they will go to the playoff match uh so there will be uh it, it is it, it is a little bit complicated so let's, let's move on so in europe there'll be four teams qualify outside um, underneath the six nations from the european championship and then the fifth team will go straight to the qualifying tournament. So basically you have the, the the tournament of region, the top team of the region, teams of the regions qualify straight to the Rugby World Cup. And then basically the, the one team down will either go to the qualifying tournament or, or yeah, will either go to the qualifying tournament or go to another intermediate qualifying tournament before going to the final qualifying tournament, which is this one here, right? So so then, uh, so then yeah, for the European team, we'll go straight for the to the final qualifying tournament tournament whereas for the pacific team we'll have to go to an intermediate game then qualify winning that game for between the winning that game then go to uh the final qualifying tournament that intermediate game we play against a south american side uh the third place team from the south american side for that intermediate game then the, the winner of that will go to the final qualifying tournament uh same thing with africa and asia the top team will go straight to the Rugby World Cup, and then the, the next one down, they will play each other first, South Africa versus Asia, and the winner of that will then go to the qualifying tournament for that last chance to go to the Rugby World Cup. Yeah, so that's a little bit complicated. Hopefully, I made that understandable, but that's basically uh, basically what's going to happen there. Moving on, <clears throat> there's a little bit of a change in the elig eligibility criteria for the Rugby um, for residency players, so players like you know, what's his name? I think Bandi Aki will be a residency player. So basically you have to play in, you have to be a resident in that country playing rugby for five, 60 months, which is five years without basically leaving the country, right? So there was obviously an issue with Spain. One of their South African import was out in Europe, traveling around, taking selfies, and then he was disqualified. And then his disqualification resulted in Spain being kicked out of the Rugby World Cup because they were disqualified for having a, a player qualif playing in their team that was ineligible, in, ineligible, not eligible. 
I can't even say the word, not eligible uh, due to the 60 month rule because he was out traveling, he wasn't staying. So they basically changed it that you are allowed to travel essentially. And as long as, as you have a genuine, close, credible, and established link to the union for 60 months, uh, it's, yeah, it's for sixth month. So it, it can be broken instead of an unbroken residency. It can be broken up. If you were to travel, there will be not an issue. So for the Pacific Nation Cup, there's a lot of team announced, but the biggest one for Fiji, Ikana Vary, has been announced for the Fijian team. And uh, yeah, a lot of Jura players uh, has been selected. And uh, yeah, Penny Ravai from the Queensland Reds, a big selection there. I've been looking forward for him to play uh, in the prop position. But yeah, yeah, a lot of, uh, a lot of the players are from the Endurance and this will be very interesting to see how they're going to go in the Pacific Nations Cup. I'll talk more about it next week in the setup. It's basically six nations uh, between, uh, like I said, Tonga, Fiji, Samoa in one pool and America, Canada and Japan in another pool and then basically the winners will play in the semi-final from those pools and then a final and then the, fi and then the winner will be decided from that tournament. Uh, Montpellier has signed uh, Ryan Lawrence from the Rebels, uh, who's a South African, living in Perth, Perfing Tang, living in Perfing Tang. And uh, finally, let's go through a little bit of bad news. So there was a player, a young player, under 19 player. Uh, I think it was under 18 plus. It was, it was only 17 year old. Went for a swim in South Africa and got swept out into the ocean. So really, really sad. Medi Najisi. It was, um, yeah, really, really sad. They're only 17 years of age. And uh, Toulouse he got, yeah. So, Cape of Good Hope in South Africa got swept out, probably by the rip, riptide, I'm guessing. Uh, really, really sad news. And finally, Ben Lamb has decided to switch to Rugby League. Not in Australia, in uh, the Catalan Dragons in French Super League. So, this is going to be a, uh, a switch to Super League instead of NRL. Anyway, thanks for watching this video, guys. Like, comment, and subscribe. Let me know your thoughts. Let me know your prediction for this weekend between... The Wallabies and the Springbok B team. And uh, yeah, thanks for watching. Have a good one. And I'll see you guys for the previews later in a couple of days. And uh, have a good one. Cheers.